member of the next generation myself fairly soon, and my feet are too big to fit into any of my shoes. Than the persona I put up here. 
But really, depending on the vertical of the group of young people who are looking at, authenticity can mean so many things and nothing at all. For example, it can be coupled with commonness, whether it's monetized, it can be coupled with disclosure, it can be coupled with vulnerability. But I like to argue that authenticity in itself is not a static quality, even then in itself is a performance. To convince you that I'm comfortable here and confident, I have to look that way and I see. To convince you later on at beer that I'm confident and comfortable with post keynote, I also have to comport my body in a certain way to convince you that I'm comfortable and off stage, right? So all forms of authenticity are performances. Celebrity is not necessarily linked to commerce. Um, we also see the rise of a lot of very visible entities on the internet who are very hot bits for value and capital. They may be the originators of these values and these capitals, but they may not be on the receiving end of this to change of exploitation. Finally, we've talked a lot about space in the last few panels, whether it's someone sharing a hashtag, whether it's people who perform the same kind of activity, and we immediately think that once people share co-presence, there must be some sort of community with coherence, with continuity, but that is not always the case. We have to remember things like social stratification, also remember that spatialities have their politics, and the kids in the back room in the canteen are not the same ones who are in the front with the air conditioning and spotlight. Um, the final thing I like to say before I go on is a bit about my politics. I tried very hard to find the source of this post from an artist, and it forgives me I could not, but if you do know them, please uh, send me the link. I don't need a therapist, I talk to my computer, so I firmly believe against the notion of digital dualism. I don't believe that inherently if I touch and see you and smell you, you are more real than if I only see you with pixels and checks. I also do not believe that mediated relationships are any less or any um, less valuable and to get than ones in the flesh. So they're different, yes, but I would like to caution us from assigning distinction to difference. Sometimes things are just different and that's okay. Let's see. Hi, I'm Rosina. I write about politics for Slate. I guess my beat really is ideological change, which has given me a reason to write some about Chinese politics and identity politics. Uh, and politics should be speaking to people quite often. Mm -hmm. yep. the, there we go. I got the wireless one, so I can walk around all Steve Jobs. Um, I'm Malcolm Harris. I wrote a book called Kids These Days, Human Capital and the Making of Millennials. And so the, the group I talk about is mostly been millennials, but I don't really recognize any younger generation than that yet. Um, so you're, you're all millennials as far as I'm concerned, even the, the kids. Um, and that goes into the, the perspective I'm writing from a little bit, which is uh, when we talk about generations and generational cohorts, usually what we're talking about these days is consumption, because that's the, the data that is most readily available to us, as well as the people most incentivized to create generational labels are marketers and people trying to sell us stuff, people who employ marketers. And so the ideas that we have of generations have become increasingly based on you know, being a target market for products. And if you go back, you don't see this nearly as much. The, the, you know, the baby boomers is about their demographic change. The greatest generation, which is really good you know, generational marketing, uh, <laughs> that's about them changing the world, you know, found the foundation of the modern republic, all these really great World War II stuff. Um, and then you get into millennials which is a, and Gen X, which are terms that are made by marketers, uh, made by branding artists. And now we're in the midst of a, a serious struggle to name the next generation. You might have heard uh, Gene Twenge, who's the, one of the leading authorities, wants to call them iGen, with the lowercase i, like the iPhone. Um, coincidentally, that happens to be the name of her consulting firm. <laughs> and so uh, in the world of generational analysis is full of uh, hucksters and marketers and hacks and no offense um, and so trying to use those same tools for 
Different Ends is my project. Uh, I'm a Marxist. I'm writing from a Marxist perspective, which means that the relation between the ownership and the laboring classes uh, is the, the key function that I'm looking at in terms of definition of generations. It does not mean that young people are the proletariat and baby boomers are the uh, bourgeoisie. That's not how a Marxist frame works. Um, just to clear that up early. So I hope we're going to have a chance to get into that a little bit more. Uh, but my, the thesis of the book is that the expanding rate of exploitation, the divergence between uh, production per worker and compensation, it, that gap opens up around the late 70s, early 80s. And that, more than anything, is what constitutes this young people, young people today, and the young people's experience today. So I, I, you, you got into a little bit where I wanted to start, which is what I, I, and I was learning this when I read your book, Malcolm, and also when we have been like watching um, the Parkland kids and what the, when we see like high schoolers now, um, what do we call them? And not, not just to be like, oh, well, what, what do we call them for the sake of having the name, but um, it seems like they're, you know, I'm, 32 and my political experience and however we're defining how a generation is shaped is going to be really different than like a 15 or 16 year old um, and and also in terms of when older people complain about young people they will often be like millennials do this millennials are ruining everything napkins uh, <laughs> avocado toast and all of it and, and sometimes they need people who are like my age and then sometimes they need like teens and I feel like I just, it's like there is the phenomenon of adults complaining about teens, which is as old as time, and then there's the specific political, uh, I think, political, social, cultural phenomenon of, of people hating millennials for what they uh, represent and what we write about Malcolm Lott is part of what they represent is not um, loving capitalism, capitalism as much as earlier generations. But I would be curious if you're, and, and, and especially since you write about college protesters, I don't know, is it? So is it meaningful to distinguish between um, college students, high school students, um, when we're talking about young people, and also the way that very young people use the internet and social media, like as opposed to people in their 20s and 30s who are technically also in the millennial generation? I can go first. Uh, I'm really lazy about that, uh, I think intentionally. So I, I am not drawing distinctions. I was talking with a class of high schoolers this morning. Um, and they found the same you know, set of patterns applied to them. I don't think your political experience as a 32-year-old, I'm 29, is that different from today's 16-year-olds even that much? That the, were, our experience has been shaped largely around the 2008 financial crisis um, and its wake. And I think that's still the case these days. I don't, where I'm looking, in not so much in terms of the epiphenomenal, like, cell phone usage or whatever, you know, that's what Twangy wants to use to define the, the younger generation is they like always had a phone. I'm much less interested in that and I think the data tells us we should be much less interested in that than long-term secular changes in you know, the mode of production in our society in terms of labor relations. Like These are the things that make generations and those have continued uh, very much since we were kids to right now without a lot of change. What do you think, Osita? What's your point about you know, the way older people sort of generalize about young people in general to call everybody's for And I think that the lens was often shorthand for young people who came up naturally with the internet or grew up with it um, from a really early age. Uh, you know, I, I think that there's some shared experience that not have said. We're all go through a lot of the same economic and political currents, even though I don't really know what's happening in high school. I think there are all kinds of platforms and different apps and things that uh, people who are 16s I have no idea about. I think, I think the broader currents are similar for all of us. Uh, we're young. Um, I think that you know, college students and high school students using that in much the same way to organize and to sort of their protests. How about you, Crystal, especially because 
I feel like some of the stuff you're talking about with social media influencers um, and internet celebrity, obviously that's something that older, that people in their 20s and 30s also do, but it also seems like something that's very much the domain of much younger people. So um, I should probably clarify that my expertise, so my first two projects were rooted in Southeast Asia, and then I look at cultural East Asia, and then in Australia, so Asia Pacific. So forgive me if my context or my idea geographies are different. But in the areas I'm familiar with, millennials are like a scapegoat black box vocabulary. It is the catch all term for we don't understand what's happening, but let's call it that. Because these are young people, and so instead of trying to understand them, why don't we just be a nice them? So the onus is on them to solve their problem, and suddenly it's magically not structural anymore. It's you didn't work hard enough to get a job or to qualify for college, and it's not because we broke the economy, right? Um, but for young people, the ones I work with who are intentionally very visible on the internet, they like to wrestle and take back the term of millennial. So yes, millennials are destroying avocado toast. At the same time, they're like, we are millennials fighting back. Because we are younger, we may not have jobs or housing or insurance. We have energy, we have code switching, we have needs, and we have these weapons of the weak or weapons of the young to fight back and form solidarities. And I feel like part of my apology is understanding this idea of frivolity. We have looked at frivolity as play, we have looked at frivolity as comfort, as catharsis. We have also looked at frivolity as community and what people do. And I think the generation of the millennials, us now, in the 13 to the 30s, this is a time of frivolity as power. Google 101, me taking over the economy, young people using deep speak to share resources in societies that say queer sexual minority rights are being repressed, fine, we'll invent our new pictorial vocabulary that you don't understand to help each other navigate this space. So I really believe that in most of the work that I do, the idea of subversive frivolity comes through. Something that's apparently very trivial and weird and probably easy to cast off, but by the very definition of the old people cast in our society, that's how we thrive under the radar. So for that reason, a lot of the young people I work with Love the term millennial. The more we demonize it, the more power we give it because we will self organize and reappropriate it for ourselves. So, to stay on you, Crystal, something um, that I want to talk about with influencers. So maybe uh, you explained it really thoroughly. I also feel like this is one of these um, things that. I feel it makes me feel like I, I'm like I don't totally understand what's going on on Instagram right now in terms of like how people um, uh, relate with brands and uh, and what an influ like what influencer culture is um, and so I want to hear you just kind of explain what you mean when you talk about influencers who who are you talking about um, and also. Um, what does that mean for young people's relationship with capitalism? Because so much of the Instagram content is like branded content. And it seems like young people are generally more and more anti-capitalist, but at the same time on Instagram, things are so, uh, it, 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 as you've written about, it's so much about um, pr presenting a brand and often being you know, literally creating sponsored content, right? Right. Um, so influencers for the uninitiated, they are the epitome of internet celebrities. So there's a wide spectrum of internet celebrities. We know them from memes to people who go viral as the face of a thing to someone who's just in one viral YouTube video. But internet celebrities also exist in this sustained, extremely lucrative, self-branded life, self-format as a career. And those are the people I term influencers, literally making money out of self-branding as a profession using your body and your physicality and your persona as the vehicle to embed messages, whatever these may be. We often think of messages as like sponsorships and products, but also on the flip side, the capacity for these to be really strong political messages in sometimes obscure millennial vocabulary that can evade censorship in places or parts of the world where there is real persecution in those governments for doing so. So those are influencers. Um, in the most extreme form, you are right, especially in the black box that is Instagram, it's very lucrative for a certain type of young person who obviously conforms to an ideal type of body, skin color, gender, sexuality, so on and so forth. There is a visibility politic there, for sure. 
But at the same time, there are a lot of other influencers who are using their platform in various ways. So in this whole mess of screens, um, pictures up here, these are the various ways of studied young people. These is, this is the, fr the front glamour, positive aspect of their lives. But it's also the secretly detrimental aspect, like emotional manipulation, emotional labor, immaterial labor, that they voluntarily sometimes put themselves through in order to maintain the space of them being a platform. So I would say we have three eras of influences so far in culture. I've studied this since 2008, and in that time, influences were simply these people who could shape opinion through word of mouth, and I feel like you're a real person and more tactile and real than Angelina Jolie. So if this works for your face and your pimples, surely it works for me, because we are communists, we are internet peasants, right? In the second era, when we got super glammed up in saturation, influences were now your advertising boards. Like, I believe you, you are perfect, if this works for you, I'm aspirationally looking towards you. So from relating from the word of mouth backstreet village talk, you now have a role model. But this is the thing, now with internet saturation, with misinformation, with the crowded ecology of indus this industry, I feel like influencers are no longer peddling aspiration or word of mouth. They are literally your tools to cut through noise on the internet. No longer are people interested in their self-brand, in their backstory, in their cat, or the color of their underwear. Literally, what influencers are being used for today is their ability to wade through the noise, either through scandal, shame, a viral video, and then put out your message to the masses of people who are just too overwhelmed with all the content. So in relation to capital flows, this, to me, in my observation, was an organic process to the way algorithms and platforms are changing but also in the way that a lot of these businesses were inserting themselves into the value chain as middlemen and then taking all the profits along the way wherever they can. So I feel like this is the way a very savvy young people fight back by changing the directions of the flow, by innovating new spaces of vocabulary and then saying, we're the only people who can speak to these people in our language, so put us back into the production chain. So that to me is their way of performing subversive frivolity. So to connect it to some of what you've written about, Osita, um, you had a piece recently uh, after the March for Our Lives um, uh, march about the the way that it was organized, and the headline was along the lines of the the March for Our Lives was a masterclass in identity politics, and um, and and to 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 talk about the you know what's going on with the Parkland kids activism more generally, um, it seems like. The, the, the intersection of you know student activism, student protest, and, and how that plays out in the internet um, is a huge aspect of if we're talking about any kind of political protest right now. Um, and there was so much talk about the Parkland teens being these digital natives and being able to like roast anybody who tried to c come for them on the internet. And so um, I, I feel like on the w it's it's almost like a uh, other side of, a, of the same coin with talking about the way kids, uh, young people are using um, Instagram to to kind of build up their own brand. There's also this like kind of fluency that they're uh, that they have with it for using um, the internet to build movements and to build protest. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess I'm curious to hear your thoughts on maybe starting with the Parkland kids, um, but also. Uh, the role of the internet kind of um, in the way that you're looking at student protests in a more historic context. All right, so I mean, what we saw with the March for Our Lives was this explosion of spontaneous organizing. I mean, they had institutional help for sure. Um, but, you know, the, these were events that were organized through social media, like many events we've seen over the past 10 years or so. Um, they got a lot of turnout, and, and, you know, that's one angle of the story. Uh, the other part of the story, when you talk about identity politics, I mean, I think that the Parkland teens were genuinely, like, sincerely attuned to the fact that they needed to reach out to other communities and make it clear to people that gun violence affects all kinds of communities um, in, in ways that are invisible to the majority in some cases. I think that they were generally aware of that. But one of the dynamics of the Internet is that if you advance narratives that are exclusionary of other people's experiences, somebody can say, well, look at me, I'm here, you know. Um, and I think that's something that made it even more likely for them, or th that encouraged them 
uh, to actually seek out people from South Central LA, South Side of Chicago, uh, majority African American neighborhoods in, in DC, and, and try to bring them in. Um, it's e it makes it easier for you to find people who are having experiences that aren't um, being put forward in the mainstream narrative. Uh, so I think that's one aspect of it. I mean, I as far as subversive frivolity goes, I mean, that's they're kind of experts at this. Um, and we saw what happened with Laura Ingram, Fox News. You know, people were dunking on her on Twitter, and that was all good. Um, one thing I one thing I am thinking about, though, and I don't really have an answer to this, is uh, when you talk about the way capitalism enters into this. Uh, these are people, young people in general, are going to have grown up uh, developing culture, organizing politically, on platforms that are not really public platforms. They look like public space, but they're not. They're owned by corporations. Um, and I'm just wondering the extent to which that has an impact moving forward as people grow older and like take an interest in like more regular politics. Um, whether people feel like, you know, Facebook is is part of how they grew up and not like a corporation, you know, and then a, a place that hires and uh, has responsibilities to workers and that kind of thing. I don't know how how shrewd and attuned people are going to be to that kind of stuff, but I think it is something worth thinking about as these companies grow and become. I mean, the, you know, they're already platform monopolies, you know, um, but that's that's something that has to. We'll have to wait for and see, I guess. Maybe Malcolm has thoughts on that. I bet he does. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do want to talk about Parkland for a second because when it happened, a lot of people, because I'd written this book, were hitting me up like, oh my God, it's like what you were talking about. You know, the kids, they're, they're, uh, they're acting. It's their time. They're ready. But it wasn't just the platforms that were corporate owned that they were, you know, acting on. It was the agenda itself, which was straight out of the Michael Bloomberg's nonprofit foundation. And part of the reason that they were able to show themselves as, you know, sophisticated political actors who understood what, you know, that agenda, agenda excludes and uh, people that agenda excludes is because that agenda is horrible. And so they were able to look at the, the liberal gun control agenda, which is about expanding the carceral state and say like, oh, but we do know that that's bad. Uh, and so they were able to advance substantial critiques of this, uh, you know, anti-gun movement that they were ostensibly leading. Uh, so, and I think that was really positive, but I think we've also got to look at what they're going to come away with that with. And I was in a, a New York high school class earlier today with some students who had organized a walkout. And when I expressed this idea that this was all kind of a con, they were nodding their heads like, yeah, that's how we feel about what happened, which is that they were used as props um, by this one specific billionaire who has had this long-standing agenda and saw an opportunity. And that it's not gonna improve their lives, it's not gonna uh, be a basis for developing youth power in this country, um, nor did it rely on any of their sophisticated political education that they've gotten over the last couple years. You know, there are young, sophisticated young political actors in this country and none of them were asked to contribute uh, to this project. So I was really skeptical about the, that whole sequence and how young people were being used um, by, uh, for a corporate agenda. To, to stay on you for one second, Malcolm, so to bring it back <laughs> to where I started with Crystal, um, lest we go down a Parkland hole, um, uh, there, I feel like, um, in your book, you talk about b one of the main takeaways from your book is that uh, kids are in this ex increasingly um, this world of, of competition and scarcity, although it's kind of a false scarcity because there's really no material scarcity in this country. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a scarcity when it comes to um, employment and housing and uh, and good jobs and all of those things. And so uh, they are in increasing competition with one another, um, and that's being fueled by their parents who also know that, um, and that the internet is a way that is goes back to the, the d it's a somewhat democratizing force because um, we know that the great things about the internet are that we can hear people speak who um, can, can speak for themselves and say, you know, this is my perspective, listen to me, and that's been this amazing thing about the internet, but also that uh, that it's a way for people to build 
um, build their own careers, build their own brands, which can be this kind of liberating thing in the way that you don't need the same amount of money to go into a, a recording studio to make an album. You can make your own stuff, but then uh, what that ends up doing, as you talk about in your book, is that it basically creates another venue of exploitation for young people, and that young people um, can, and, and, and to be honest, I, s I wonder what will happen with the Parkland kids too, now that they are these internet celebrities, but that, that young people can build up this, um, this brand, and it feels so, on the one hand, I think I watch it and I'm often inspired, and I feel like this is so cool that people are able to speak for themselves, and people are able to speak about these ideas that people weren't hearing before, but then on the other hand, um, it makes, it, it makes, it sets those kids up to, um, to then, you know, be in competition for the few spots that remain to be somebody who's going to get picked up to, uh, you know, to produce an album or to become a, a you know, a, a go-to voice that gets um, invited to come on cable news or whatever. Mm -hmm. So talk about that that kind of huge focus of your book. Yeah, it, one of the big issues there is that it, it mystifies people's role in the economy. And so if you think about a worker is someone who, you know, has a nine to five job with benefits and they have a relationship with their employer who is a, an employer who employs them. Uh, if we think that's what a worker is and then you look at your life and you say, well, I don't do that. I'm an entrepreneur of the self. You know, I'm a, I'm a millennial. I'm a, I manage my own brand. I, I own my own human capital. But you don't own your own human capital and we should be very clear about that. Um, and it goes for the influencers as well. You can't just uh, you know, sell your follower account. You need to go to a capitalist who will pay you um, to advertise for them. I've gotten this question when I was uh, talking at Harvard. There was a really conservative student who was really hyped to like, ask this question about, like, you say you're an anti-capitalist, but you're like, selling your thoughts to a capitalist publisher who is publishing that and selling them in America. You know, what do you think about that? And it's been so mystified, the relationship between workers and owners, that people don't realize that someone in a position where the only thing they have to sell is their labor is the definition of a worker. And if you're selling your, your writing, your thoughts, uh, to someone who owns a printing press, you're a worker. You're not a capitalist. And young people, in particular, have been sold a bill of goods with regard to their place in the economy. Um, but they need to get back to fundamentals a little bit. If you don't own capital, you're a worker. If you don't own the factory, you're a worker. And there is no you know, factory of your computer. There, you don't own Twitter. You don't own your brand. You don't own your capital. Uh, you don't own nothing, so. <laughs> well, so maybe we want to, I want to make sure to save time for questions. One um, question I wanted to ask all of you and this is something that um, Sarah Jaffe, who is the moderator of the next keynote, uh, likes to say is that uh, the kids are all right, right? Which means like the kids have so much better politics so often. Um, we see kids having actively better politics now. Um, and I work with middle schoolers and I see that like all the time. And I, I just am often just like so moved to be like, oh my God, kids are so much like less binary than they used to be. And they're so much queerer and they're so, it's just like so, uh, exciting and wonderful to 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 see um, young people's understanding of the world, um, but that also the whole kids are all the, the kids are all right thing is a way for older people to kind of exonerate themselves and to say uh, the, the the kids will figure it out. And also, we did see this a lot with Parkland. People would be like, "Oh, thank God, the next generation is going to fix all of this." And it's this way that people can just kind of like be like, "Not not on us. They they got it." Um, and I guess my question is like, um, what are each of your thoughts on what inspires you about young people and what do you feel like is like really great? I, I feel so optimistic when I think about young people, but also I feel like Malcolm is not, does not feel that way. And so uh, like, yeah, and then I'll, yeah, not that you don't feel that way, but it's more complicated than that, that we can't just look at young people and be like, oh my God, they're so great, they've got it. And so I guess I'd like to hear each of your thoughts on kind of um, what inspires you and also what, what challenges do you think that they're facing that we really can't like gloss over? So the weird thing about young people is that they become old people eventually. 
and <laughs> weird things start happening when you turn into an older person uh, politically. Uh, this has been the case for many, many years. So I don't know how far we can predict based on you know what current political attitudes are. Although I do think that on questions of social politics, like the the swing that's been that's happened is going to hold. Like we're not going to go back on LGBTQ questions and uh, race questions. I hope um, we'll s we'll see. Um, but you know, I I think it's. The next generation cannot fix climate change, right? Like that's n that used to happen now. And there, there's there's a whole set of problems that if you just sort of uh, force them upon the people who are coming up, um, you're really abdicating, obviously, a lot of responsibility. And it's it's how problems remain in place. I mean, people have been hoping that the next generation will fix like the problems with contemporary capitalism for a long time. And it seemed that way, like in the 1960s, people thought, wow, you know these guys are gonna grow up and smash everything and they voted for Reagan, you know, like, so, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would like to be optimistic, um, but I would be a lot more optimistic if there was more happening now. But I do think that, that on a lot of important attitudes, the kids are all right. There is a, a group of survey results that was released by Pew yesterday. They do this annual survey of American attitudes on political life. It showed that across all kinds of questions about political norms, young people were like less into the maintenance of certain long-standing principles. Like, oh, you know, it, it's important that we sh you know, shake hands and are polite with our enemies and um, decorum and all. Like, young people are not as into that, uh, understandably. If that, <laughs> I hope that holds. Uh, but you know, weird things happen when you start aging. So we'll see. Um, I am going to pretend like I can answer this question through three stories, if I may. Um, are the young, well, you can on the one hand say young people are destroying both the economy and avocado toast, and then on the other hand go, but they're all right, they're, they will fix things, and it's always a very convenient scapegoat, I said again. But at the same time, because of the way this generation has grown up, all of us, 13 to 30, and whoever else would like to be in this category, I feel like we have been structurally made to be resilient. And as much as I don't want to be like a weird eugenics person, the politics of our upbringing, the fact that reading about bombings and shootings is an everyday milieu, it's not the one phenomenon of the year that you look back on, it's a weekly event. This conditions you and forces you into exercising resilience whether or not you like it. For many young people, this is a burden that weighs at the back of your mind. For other young people who have resources, who have the literacies, maybe who are even angry enough to mobilize, this resilience from this type of structural inequality breeds very beautiful and productive things. For example, some of the influences that I love talking about are those who have made their personal super political. Troy Savan is a YouTuber from Perth, where I live, who started out as a five-year-old boy with a great singing voice. So at first, he was on the internet because his parents were recording him, and he was selling the label of his voice. When he came of age, he decided to make his milestone coming out video, which of course changed the way in which many people related to him. At that time, because it was still not yet chic to come out on Facebook, um, on YouTube, now like if you don't have a coming out video on YouTube, are you even a real YouTuber, right? <laughs> but in his time, it was still a risk and he felt there was a responsibility to show what he felt was an authentic self between his brand and his life in his bedroom. So he did that. But he never stopped being an influencer. In that second row of videos you see, He's engaged in very specific forms of social activism. Yes, with commerce, because it's labor to be paid. But just because influencers are paid for their labor doesn't mean they're sellouts. It's a different form of literacy, a different form of education, a different form of even science communication to get an idea across to you in a two-minute video. Whether it's blowing up a condom, and then in two minutes teaching you how to have safe sex, or talking about your first pride experiences. But with every good thing in life or on the internet, there is this CD underbelly, and I'm not going to name the number of the rule in which this categorizes something like Reddit. Um, but 
Also, when young people start to fight for the same resources, we have the phenomenon of competitive one-downmanship. If I cannot compete with you on the prestige economy to be the best and the most successful, let us compete about whose life sucks more and let's fight for who gets more pity or who is more vulnerable. And then all of a sudden, something as strong as Crenshaw's idea of intersectionality becomes commodified. I deserve more airtime because I have X number of identity markers that puts me in this special box. So put all your resources on me. I'm not saying that this is a bad thing, and I'm saying it's a very interesting and natural knee-jerk response into being cornered to fight for space and voice and visibility. But at the same time, those of us who are up in the hierarchy have the responsibility to try and figure out the commonalities we have to build allyship. And I think young people like queer YouTubers are doing that very well. I'm going to lie and tell you two stories instead of three, because I've been hearing my voice for a long time, and that's a bit weird. In a special place, and special being code word for a place with strong censorship, strong government ideologies, still very conservative in that same-sex partnerships are not legalized, but same-sex X can put you into jail. Um, influencers in these parts of the countries in Southeast Asia have to innovate with how they push out messages, how they do self-expression, and how they do activism. My favorite example is in the two bottom screen grabs. They are Muna Herzi official. I'm happy to chat with any of you who would like links to them. They are a micro minority in terms of gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, religion, and language in a country called Singapore that's only like 5.5 million strong. So for a tiny country, they're a minority, and within their demographics, they're a micro minority. Instead of going out there and causing trouble and then risk being thrown into prison for sedition laws, because that is a thing and a reality in many Southeast Asian countries, they play with the idea that because people just think we're young people performing on the internet and producing content, I'm going to be super Lady Gaga-esque and subversive in my videos. I'm going to congregate in groups of more than 5 or 7 after 11 p.m. that could get me thrown into jail and document it in a video and put it on YouTube but if anyone comes for me, I have plausible deniability to say this is just entertainment. If you do not have back literacies and back stories to see the symbolism and how these parody Beyonce videos, how this parody Nicki Minaj videos, if you're not in tune with the pop cultural references, the social justice vocabulary, I can very easily say, oh, I'm sorry, plausible deniability, all of this was entertainment. Safeguarding myself, safeguarding my community, at the same time, maintaining the layers of subtext that I have to my people that I'm responsible for. So yes, I feel like young people are very resilient, but the best of the lot, best meaning being able to channel this productively, are uh, also super angry, but angry enough to portray this eloquently that they know how to protect themselves while pushing out a message like these people. OK, I'll be quick so we can get to questions. Um, I am optimistic about the next generation, despite uh, what those of you who may have read the book may have concluded uh, from the book, <laughs> because uh, I don't put my optimism there at the end because it would probably get me in trouble, which is that I'm not optimistic that we are going back to you know the Fordist bargain of the 20th century between capital and labor. That's dead. It's not come back. Um, it's really not. What I am optimistic is that history is not over. And to see ourselves currently in the midst of history is to understand that the social system we have now is not forever. The economic system we have now is not forever. Um, it's contingent, it's limited, it's even young as far as you know, humanity goes. Uh, and that things can still change and we can still make things change. And so my optimism is like about, you know, the emergence of literal civil war in this country. It's not like, uh, it's not gonna be nice. It's not gonna be like, I'm so glad this is happening. Now the kids have saved us. Uh, if the kids are going to, and by kids, I don't mean young people per se, because they, they grow up. I'm talking about you know a, a cohort of people, people born within a certain set of time and a certain set of time within history. Uh, Meaning, as we age, we might be. You're, you're, you're. No I'm matter what happens to our generation, you us. want it to be us, well, even I'm as we get older. I'm talking. Yeah. I'm, well, and it's 
and it's not it's not about being young it's about being born when we were born under the circumstances under which we're born um, and those are unfortunate circumstances in the history of this country in a lot of ways and we have to acknowledge that um, at the same time it might be the end of the story of this country which would be really fortunate uh, from my perspective <laughs> and so so uh, they let you talk at a school yeah right <laughs> The, the NYPD guards at the front were not really psyched about it. Um, but, but and, I, and I mean this like not being like coy or jokey or whatever, like these are serious questions. We are in the midst of existing social war right now. We are losing uh, by the day, um, but I don't think it's over. So I think we can take questions from there. With that, let's open it up to questions, please. Um. Hey, thank you all for um, really fascinating ideas. Um, I guess I'm wondering like, how we should define what youth is. Um, we, we, you, we talked about youth as something that like, goes away when people get older, and also millennials being anywhere between 18 and 31. So, and it seems to me that millennials especially seem to Ha, like adopt down the to to the uh, perspectives, the attitudes of like their younger millennial cohorts. Um, and you even mentioned that maybe millennials are like the last generation here. So how should we define exactly what youth is? This is not a question to anybody in particular. I don't know. Um, <laughs> sorry. Well, well, I, I, I have like two thoughts. Uh, age categories uh, are weird. I mean, w what we consider like th the teenager today, right, was not always a thing. It was shaped by like industrial capitalism and the certain changes in the economy. Um, and I think that that's almost what defines what youth is, right? Like, young people don't really own anything, I think would be one good way of uh, describing it. I don't own anything, like I'm sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 in debt actually, I have like a negative net worth. Uh, older people are generally not that much. I mean, gen well, they have debt, but they have property and, and different things. So I, I, one way to think about youth is just precarity, uh, insecurity, especially now, given the kinds of trends that Malcolm has written about. But it's always sort of been like, if you're a young person, you haven't really set found solid footing in the world yet. I think that's been a constant for some time and becoming older is a process of establishing certain bases for yourself. I have two keywords. I don't actually know what is going to come out of my mouth, but let's try. I feel that young people as a category assigns them liminality, where it's okay to just be. And if you cannot emerge from your cocoon to be a butterfly, stay in there for a little while more, even if this means you millennially are a young person up to age 35, according to the UN. So that capture or that basket of liminality does have its benefits. Of course, it does exist because of structural inequality in which young people cannot cross over into legitimate adulthood with all those markers, debt-free, proper education, jobs, so on and so forth. But I also think that liminality gives us time to figure things out or to hide until we can figure it out or until the world changes, if it does. The second phrase that is coming to me that doesn't really make sense yet is the idea of a safety valve. As a young person, you do get scapegoated for a lot of things f for your age, even if a lot of it has nothing really to do with age connotations like maturity or development or intellect. But at the same time, it's a good safety valve because you get to affiliate yourself with the younger cohort downwards in the age gap, and that shields you and protects you from layers of responsibility when convenient. I know this sounds mean, but it's true. We do use this productively to our end sometimes. So safety valve and liminality. I said things. Thank you. More questions? Any? Okay, here we go. Hey, hey, Molly. 
uh, I for Crystal, I got a, I got a little story that I would love your like thoughts on. Um, I was working with a uh, youth, uh, this guy who had sort of become. Uh, he was like the guy you sort of shared at the end. He became uh, uh, sort of visible because of his uh, queerness online. Uh, and uh, he had become, he, he had used the internet to sort of save him from, he had grown up rural, in rural America as a queer kid, and he had been really suicidal as a kid. And then the internet sort of saved him uh, in the ways that you can imagine that it saved him. And then he became way very visible. And then he became really addicted to the internet and addicted to that visibility and became suicidal on that side of, uh, of it. And I'm curious as to your thoughts about how youth are being affected. Like, I guess I'm just curious as to your thoughts on that story. I've thought about it a lot. Right. I had a really excellent brain fart with a friend yesterday, a Twitter friend who was nice and turned out to not be a serial killer. So I do have faith in young people. Um, but we came up with the phrase, the medium is the medicine, and that the format of the internet, just the idea that this is a medium accessible to you, regardless of what you actually put on there, regardless of your audience, regardless of your message, was very relieving that you had this access or this backdoor to push out messages. So the medium is the medicine, meaning because this exists like no other, and because this is something I can put in my pocket, this is something I can keep close to me and control, even if only five people are reading my tweets, I have the illusion that I am being heard, whether or not I am. And this process brings validation for some people. Now, again, I don't want to be an advocate for replacing all forms of internet sociality and network um, connections with in the flesh relations, because that's how we get casualization of labor, how everyone has to survive on Uber or TaskRabbit to pay your rent. But at the same time, it's very tempting to equate the visibility of the screen with actual fresh, fleshy and fresh resources. And again, visibility and the feedback mechanisms that give us that comfort do not always lead to the medicine that we need, whether it's commerce, whether it's therapy, whether it's healing, whether it's community. So I think what you're talking about is a very specific threat in which these young people replace visibility and fill themselves with that feedback that they get. It's attention to what they're talking about. It does not address what they're talking about. It doesn't give them what they need from what they're verbalizing and what they're talking about. So it is an audience, but it's not an audience that can respond to them in the way they need. It's just an audience. Therefore, like I've ascertained previously, visibility, but not glamour, celebrity, but not commerce, so on and so forth. Hope I answered your question. More questions? Jeremy, I saw your hand first. Uh, uh, on only men are raising their hands. I'm not just picking only men. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to say. I just want to say this has been a great talk. I've really enjoyed everybody's presentations. One thought I had is that I've, I've studied Russian peasants. I do Russian history, so I really was into the weapons of the weak reference, of course, James Scott. I've read a lot of James Scott. But uh, the question does come to my mind, though, that if we're using this terminology and idea of, 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 of children, or not children, of kids using these platforms of influencers, of carving out their own language and space, but using these weapons of the weak, I mean, the peasants never got strong. You know, peasants always stayed pretty weak. Do you see any way uh, that that these models of, of, of people using these platforms like Twitter, like Facebook, these are all corporate owns we've discussed, but is there any real way for people to escape sort of that problem of becoming not weak using these platforms? Is there any hope for that at all? Or do we have to kind of agree with Malcolm and say, it can't really happen until you change that fundamental relationship? Is there a way, basically with the way it works now, that it can actually, they can become strong and not just use these weapons of the weak? Right, so maybe one day in the distant future, that might be a possibility. Um, my work with these young people is with the reality that we are trapped in this space now. We could wait and wallow in pity and hope the world changes when you wake up, or we could work with what we have. And again, my basis being a lot of these examples I draw from are from Southeast Asian nations where not only is the state repressive, not only is there strong militarism, a lot of the personal values and freedoms, like being able to walk out on the street and hold hands with the same-sex partner, 
or have a YouTube rant about the government are not available to them. So for these young people, constructing these vocabularies and still relying on the platforms that are inherently part of the problem is all they've got. And they are very happy and content to make do with what they have until the next offer. So I have been asked several times, OK, but is there real change? Are they really changing the system? And my question is, this is not even a question we can ask these peoples because they are not at the level of this privilege. And I would like to focus on the fact that they are making the best of what they have to reach the next step rather than throw them the ideological question that would then paralyze them from activating or organizing at all. I guess I've got a, a different perspective on that one, um, which is that the the tools the and the sort of weapon of the weak and resilience um, can definitely put you in a spot where you're treading water until maybe you get to take over. Um, and it goes back to the question of how do we define youth? Well, one of the definitions is it's before you're in power, right? Um, and the older people are the people in power, and that switches when they die and you gain power. I saw some uh, report about inheritance and millennials, that you know millennials are gonna get really rich when the, the older generation dies. The problem is with you know life extension and stuff, that's gonna be when we're in our 60s. Uh, so maybe that's when our, our youth is over, is when we're in our 60s, right? And we can like tread water and live in tiny houses which, like, you know, the idea that we should desire to live in tiny houses is ridiculous. It just means you should want less space. You should want less. And we can live with that, um, you know, as a cohort indefinitely. Like, it's probably true. We could live on less and we'll continue to. Um, we can find a way to make that work. But I don't think we shouldn't confuse that with what's politically desirable. And there has been in this country, in our country particularly, in America, um, about 50 year moratorium on the threat of large scale political violence. And I think that can break down. And I think that is starting to break down. And we're witnessing the reemergence of political violence uh, in this sphere. And so we're going to be talking less about weapons of the weak. Or if we're going to be talking about weapons of the weak, it's not going to be memes. It's going to be, you know, cars going through sidewalks and stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's, it, that, that's, a, that's a clean version. I don't think we're going to get the clean version. OK, we have time for one more question. <laughs> uh, uh, we have time for one more question. Then again, right after this panel is the socialism panel. Uh, but we have time for one more. <laughs> Easy segue. I actually saw your hand first. Sarah, someone put the set you up well. Um, so two questions. First, um, how do you think net, the end of net neutrality will affect uh, what you're talking about with the, uh, the empowerment of the weaker and, and, and so forth? And also, uh, in terms of uh, Marxism, I think a lot of people might empathize you know, with your views on Marxism. But um, how do you see? Uh, if Marxism were to gain, or something like that were to gain traction in this country, how would we avoid the problem of Marxism that we've seen in history with China and, and Russia becoming capitalistic after going through a Marxist type of uh, situation? I'll, I'll take the first one first, and, or the second one first, and then hand the mic over for the second one. But I think, I think we'll get to that a lot in the next panel, I would imagine. Um, but, but history keeps moving, right? You never step into the same river twice. So those, those experiments happened under very specific circumstances. Um, we, we should also reevaluate the actual content of those experiments. It's worth saying I'm not a tanky. Uh, <laughs> but I think we have a lot more to learn from the, those experiments than we have. I'm, and I'm totally serious. Um, but whatever the 21st century project of uh, Marxism is going to be, it's going to be different than the one we've seen, if only because we have that experience and we can learn from it. I don't really, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really think net neutrality is going to affect uh, whether or not we enter some sort of violent revolution. 
I think if that's going to happen, they're going to probably blow past whatever net neutrality means and do it. Um, but you know, to this larger question of the extent to which we can expect large scale political violence or upheaval, I mean, I don't know. You know, I don't know how the weak become strong. It's something people have been trying to do through uh, existing democratic institutions for a long time. Um, people like me are sort of naive, eternal optimists. Th the idea that uh, eventually, if you get enough critical mass of people who are weak, you can do things to change institutions uh, in a way that allow you to actually implement things that you want. Uh, but I don't know if that's true. It's just sort of a vague hope. There's a lot of evidence that it doesn't work out very well. Um, so I don't really know. Maybe, maybe you know, the solution is to send Facebook invites to the revolution. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we're going to find out either way. I think that we will, with that, we will let the socialist panel get ready. Uh, that panel is going to totally rule. Um, and I'm so glad that I got to talk with you three, Crystal, Osita, and Malcolm. Thank you so much. Thanks.